Earth is a planet teeming with life. Mankind, 7 billion strong, continued to prosper. However, this prosperity had a price. To a species unable to halt the environment's destruction, the land of ruin will inevitably appear. Even so, mankind, desperate for salvation, clung to hope. A brave few begin their mission to the enigmatic land of ruin. Little realizing this harsh journey will decide man's fate. The world is dying, polluted by man in many ways, spoiled by humanity's habitation, destroyed by the machines and technological growth, poisoned by the human depravity, perverted by the physical desire for want, and crippled by the unsustainable population. This is the world of Shin Megami Tensei's strange journey. In this video, we will explore the development history of the game, the thoughts and feelings of the staff, the plot its re-release, and what it all means. This is an exploration into the mystery of the swan song of the old guard at Atlas. This is an uncovering of the secrets not many know about. Put on your demonicas, activate the relevant sub-apps, let's explore the Schwarzfeld. This game is a unique situation. In the Megaten Maniacs, the book documenting the history of the Shin Megami Tensei series and the franchise as a whole, it's explained here that this game is very different from the rest of the mainline games. The game divides itself into sections, the worldview and the setting are separated from the numbered entries, and in a way, the human and demon relationships have an echo to what the Persona series does in terms of introspection and levels of intimacy. Strange Journey was released October of 2009, more than five years after Shin Megami Tensei 3. Development for Strange Journey started in fall of 2007. An easy rumor to dispel is the misconception that this game was ever intended to be Shin Megami Tensei 4 at any period of time. In one interview, Cosmo Conico, the producer, character, and demon designer, and the person who provided the original concept, and much of the new core gameplay introduced in Strange Journey, joked about it being SMT4 because of the quality of the game being that great. In another interview on the Japanese Strange Journey website, he says that he originally had an idea for Shin Megami Tensei 4, but wasn't sure he was going to be able to do it. This is likely in reference to the then unknown long draft he had wrote that contained a first act that would be used as the foundation of the story for Shin Megami Tensei 4. This statement is cited on Wikipedia for being evidence that Strange Journey was going to be Shin Megami Tensei 4, but he continues to say in Strange Journey Reminiscence, as well as quite a few other Japanese only interviews, that Eiji Ishida came to him saying, Let's make a game that uses elements from Mega Ten and let you explore and combine them. According to Kaneko, this project could have been an original series like Devil Summoner or Persona. The sales team at Atlas, however, wanted the work of Strange Journey to be titled SMT4. And here's what he says. It's not that I don't understand why they want to do that, because the image is clear and it's easy to sell, but the flow of the project is definitely not for. The game was interesting because at the time there was a lot of hype for a console release, rumored to be in the works way back in 2005 on the PS3. However, this was never intended for the PS3, and the DS wasn't even the first choice either. They actually considered the PSP at first. The reason they didn't go with the PSP was because they figured that the DS would allow for more new fans. Plus, the two new screens would mean information could be on one screen, making switching from the game and menus not an issue. The game was developed with help from Lancars. They cite their work on Strange Journey as being programming in general. This team also worked with Atlas on other projects including Etrian Odyssey and Persona Q2. 
Strange Journey being built in their Etrian engine. Strange Journey is somewhat infamous for being one of, if not the most, difficult Shin Megami Tensei game. Ishida says Strange Journey's difficulty comes from a focus on the reason the player loses in battle. If the player can analyze the battle and understand why they lost, they can figure out how to win the next battle. The hope was that increasing the focus on fusion would encourage players to fuse. The game design was also structured around the experience. This means that Atlas staff designed the game with a focus on creating a catered experience and the game's systems and theme centers around exploration. Ashida says that the demons that became central to the story were chosen by the team members with a deep knowledge of demons, presumably referring to Kazuma Kaneko and Shogo Isogai. In addition, the demon roster overall was chosen to fit the theme of the game and its story. The game features over 300 demons. This is considered by Kaneko to be one of the strongest points of the franchise. Not all the demons are imaginary creatures. Many are based on mythology and folklore worldwide. Therefore, if you play this game, you can become a walking encyclopedia, according to Kanika. When designing demons, Kanika said there's numerous rules he follows. The most important thing to him, which he has tried to keep consistent since he first started, is to follow these rules. The simplified approach he takes is to try and comprehensively emphasize characteristics of the demon and arrange them in a modern fashion while presenting them in an original way. Sounds a lot easier than it actually is. Kaneko uses his experience designing Morax in Strange Journey, for example. Drawing on the origins, the Key of Solomon, where he's summoned by a magician and able to inform the person who summons him about astronomy, this depiction would have to consider his Solomon description as having the head of a bull and the body of a human. To differentiate the design, Kaneko made sure to not make the bull design the same breed as other bull demons, instead drawing a bison head. To represent the astronomy piece of his mythology, Kaneko gave him a cane which holds a celestial globe with a sun and moon on top. Many mechanics from previous entries return, including demon recruitment, the moon phase system, demon fusion, and tweaks and new elements to the design. This game introduced a new mechanic called Devil Co-op. Similar to previous games, demons hold alignments, law, neutral, and chaos. If the alignment of the befriended demon is the same as the protagonist, and a weak point is hit, it's possible to get a free second attack. This was something Kaneko considered an exciting addition, as it brought a new level of planning, with the alignments, and a way to do additional damage without using MP. Kaneko discussed why the press turn wasn't used in Strange Journey, and it's pretty simple. They wanted to tweak the system a bit, commenting that many other games in the franchise mess with that formula, with Persona 3 and 4 with the one more system, and Devil Survivor with the extra turn system, and Rhino 2 with the mag balance system. The idea of giving increased value to alignments, but not as restrictive as older SMT games, where the opposite aligned demons would not be recruited at all. This idea was essentially to give value to the alignments in a way different from the older games where opposite aligned demons just couldn't be recruited at all. Auto battle returns to the game, providing a way to reward players who advance through sections of the game with proper planning, as they would be incentivized to build demons for the various sections of the game and provide another reward for planning outside of co-op. At this point in Atlas's life, this was the fastest auto battle in the franchise as well. In talking about battles, the team tried to strike a balance between approachable gameplay for the new players, but also enough things for long-term fans to enjoy. For example, there are strong enemies strewn about and you're warned about their existence. You will most assuredly suffer a crushing defeat at first until you can create a counter team to those situations. This was intended so you unconsciously grow with the game's difficulty. Fundamentally, the game focuses on customizing demons and training them. This is explored also with the demon source system. Gaining insight into a demon by using them in your party will give you their source, which allows you to fuse a new demon with the source to gain skills exclusive to that demon. This adds a level of complexity when creating demon builds as you can only gain a single source per demon. In quite a few Mega Ten titles, the player uses a comp to summon and store demons. In this game, you are given the Demonica, which upon entering the Schwarzfeld, you and everyone else with the Demonica gain the demon summoning program, which allows you to do just that. This suit was based on ideas of retrofuturism and draws from designs like the robot in Metropolis, and while Kaneko enjoys the Demonica design, he said he feels bad as it would not be easy to draw or cosplay for fans. 
The suit draws inspiration from 2000 Leagues Under the Sea with the concept of an old fashioned diving suit. And also the ancient tokusatsu show Captain Ultra. The color coordination used on the Demonica jackets was actually something that Kaneko was inspired from Star Trek. Narratively, this suit is meant to be a durable life support system for exploring unknown regions, but also a core mechanic to this game is gaining items and using them to create new features and upgrades for the Demonica, as well as your weapons, a gun, and a knife. The game also adds a challenge component in the way of EX missions. This is an optional content often making nods to mythology of demons featured in the game and rewarding the player with often rare good. You also have play records, which is basically an achievement system to reward the player for reaching landmarks such as mapping or falling through holes in the floor. There are 150 of these in total. One aspect of the gameplay that was implemented at Kaneko's request was the password system. This came about from Kaneko asking how they could implement communication system for fans, how to make a way for Megaton fans to share their experiences as well as their built demons, he said this was a goal behind the password system. Despite the fact, he said himself, he knew many fans were not interested in socializing over Megaten, and he is also somewhat of an isolationist himself. This is also why the forums were made, mostly, to provide a place for fans to congregate and boast their demon builds. An interesting byproduct of this was that some special passwords were made featuring names of staff, mythological references, or lore words and phrases, like a Mishiguji with the password 2000, or Shiva with the password Cosma Kaneko, among many others. Kaneko's idea for the style of gameplay came in part from his love of Tetris, a game he cited as being among his favorites and most played. He said, wouldn't it be good to have a Mega Ten that you could fill the space of small gaps of time you had? like Tetris or Minesweeper does. The other aspect Kaneko considered was the DS itself. He was concerned for the complexity of gameplay that could be offered on the DS without losing quality of experience. Initially, this manifested as a game with a heavy dungeon exploration focus and demon fusion with little to no story. In the end, the game grew to having a rich story, but the gameplay design was still the primary focus. In regards to the game design, there were many scrapped ideas that didn't materialize. In the final release, or in the enhanced port, Shin Megami Tensei Strange Journey Redux. One such example was a new game plus in-game app called New Megami Tensei. In the original game, this was an app where launching it resulted in nothing happening, meant as a joke from the development team. For Redux, initially this was going to launch a minigame. The minigame would have had a combat simulator where the player could continuously play this roguelike with procedurally generated dungeons, but the minigame proved to be too expensive and a little too time consuming to be introduced. The story drew from John Carpenter's The Thing and the reboot of Battlestar Galactica among many other things. There's also some references to The Thing, with Blair and Norris likely being nods to the film and literary references with Arthur and Vern being names of famous authors Jules Verne and Arthur C. Clarke. This continues into the other AI in Strange Journey Universe, with Isaac being the name of the gigantic AI, a reference to Isaac Asimov, and George from Redux being a reference to a famous science fiction George, whether that's George Orwell, H.G. Wells, or even George Lucas. The cast of the game are people in their late 20s and early 30s, or even as old as being in their 40s in Gore's case. This, according to Ishida, was a natural progression of ideas, leading them to create an older cast of characters that stood out against the largely teen cast of other Mega Ten titles. The storyline surrounding the investigation team needed to represent the whole of humanity, so it needed many people from different international backgrounds. It also wasn't realistic to feature younger people as elite military personnel. Antarctica was chosen as the setting because of this more international focus and because it symbolized unprecedented danger. Because the story has a fixation of the entirety of humanity, the location needed to represent no particular group of people, and in real life, because of a treaty, no one can claim ownership of Antarctica. This location choice was also inspired by the thing. One of the first locales considered was actually New York, with John Carpenter's Escape from New York being the catalyst for the idea. This was shut down purely because if it took place in New York, then it would have to feature an American cast of soldiers. Even further, Kaneko posits that Megaten isn't born from a familiar locale like Kichijoji or Shinjuku, but rather from a familiar crisis. All players are the sole investigators to find the answer to what caused this crisis, and as soon as you start grasping the truth, 
you will experience the traditional fear and atmosphere of the series. The decision to not base the game in Tokyo also had some significance to Kaneko. At this point, he has lived and always lived in Tokyo, and liked writing from his perspective, which inevitably meant placing the Mega Ten games in Tokyo. As a youth, he mentioned walking around and imagining how interesting it would be to see all the buildings collapse, and that when you're young, you're often very dissatisfied with the systems in the world. It's hard to do what you want to do, you're constantly denied, and the only way to adapt to society is to gradually fit in, killing yourself. So instead, that's why there's a feeling to destroy Tokyo, and that by doing so, the disparity will disappear, making everyone equal. If the inequity of the world was removed, Kaneko felt he would be able to work harder. The comparison to RPGs was that typical RPGs make you the son of a hero, the son of a king, to which in the Mega Ten world that would be something like being the son of the president or the boss's son of a big company. And this is something that Kaneko could and relate to. I am part of a village and I'm the son of a poor man, so I'm supposed to help out. Do the laundry, clean the house, etc, etc. It's about how someone like that can become a hero. Shin Megami Tensei is about that. So regarding Tokyo, it was a good place to work from because of that is how Kaneko could channel the narrative from the perspective of an average individual. But since there was this idea of brevity in gameplay and interruptions due to the portability of the DS, as well as Kaneko's other ideas about the structure of the narrative, that's why Tokyo was abandoned. Because it was decided very early on to build a game based on the dungeon crawling, the dungeons needed to follow a theme. This became that the sectors are the materialization of the negative karma that mankind has cast upon Earth. The way Kaneko described it is that humanity responds to the Earth's antibodies. This was also considered to be a game about the war for resources, as well as the human ego. Kaneko had an idea for this game since SMT1 that came to mind again while he was working on Nocturne, where he wanted to tell a story about traveling through a chaotic world, and that idea formed into Strange Journey. It's not necessarily a chaos themed game, but it has a chaotic feel. The name of the game came from a few places. Journey popped into Kaneko's mind because he used to love the band of the same name. The movie Event Horizon was also an inspiration, and calling the game Shin Megami Tensei Event Horizon was an idea that they had come up with as well. This became Strange Horizon. Then the idea for using the band's name came up, and Kaneko recalled there was also a The Who documentary called Amazing Journey. This resulted in the idea of either calling it Shin Megami Tensei Strange Journey or Shin Megami Tensei Journey. An unusual aspect of the development was the relationship between Kazuma Kaneko and Eiji Ishida. Among the credits Kaneko accrued for this project, he is also credited as the producer. When discussing this, Kaneko stated it was internal production, so he wasn't working a more traditional producer role of collecting money to get the game finished. He stated it was more collaborative, and the role credits are almost irrelevant, something echoed in old other Mega Ten titles. In regards to Strange Journey, Ishida functioned as the field director with Kaneko guiding but also working in a generally less hierarchical system. The game's vision was a mix of what Eiji Ishida wanted and what Cosmo Kaneko wanted and its development was a balance of trying to accomplish what both envisioned. Another concept is Ishida wanted a strong systemic motivation. In other words, motivation to proceed in the game because of a compelling story, which is why the game frames much of the narrative with missions. This was influenced in part by the fourth Elder Scrolls title, Oblivion. Ashido wanted to make a game where even if you play just for a little while, the pace is still good because you can still make progress, whether it's simply just getting a rare object today or crafting a new weapon or creating a demon with a unique skill. To Ishida, the tempo is one of the most important factors for the game. This is why you can skip things and even auto battle. I want to talk briefly about the Devil Analyze system. Kaneko recalls as a child reading a book which had a section about the Devil's Army. I cannot figure out what book he's talking about. It said that Lucifer's wife was Lilith and that Lucifuge was his judge and that Belphegor commanded legions in hell and so on. This relates to why demons and gods were created in the first place, to explain natural phenomena. Kaneko tries to relay the concept in Strange Journey Reminiscence by comparing demonic god lore to his own Wikipedia article. He talks about how it has all this information about him written as if it's from his perspective, and that this is the sort of autonomy of information that is exactly how gods and demons came to exist. And in thinking of that, he considered that over time, you'd learn more and more about a demon until you came to understand who they were, 
as you stock data on it. Creating items was also a new concept. Partially, this was born from the idea of not having the House of Evil or Cathedral of Shadows. It was also included to make the game more addictive by allowing more experimentation and exploration. This is also the reason why sub apps came into being, to allow flexibility in play and to give players more freedom to do what they want. Another interesting note for this project is that at the time of its development, Konica was the Atlas staff with the longest tenure, joining the company early in its creation after the release of Megami Tensei 1, but all the staff of the time of Digital Devil Story Megami Tensei and prior had all moved on or quit the gaming industry. This resulted in a wide gap in Konica's interpretation of what makes a Mega Ten game versus all the other staff who cited games Konica developed as part of the reasons for joining the company. This resulted in a decision to try and find a middle ground with Strange Journey, to maintain the identity of Megaten that longtime fans would be familiar with, while acknowledging these new interpretations of Megaten and how they should be incorporated as time goes on. The knowledge that many staff played his games when they were in middle school or high school might make for a higher effort interpretation of Megaten. For example, the younger staff carefully read and take fan feedback and opinions on the internet seriously. To Kaneko, it is important to surprise people and also to imagine what the fans want and incorporate it to a certain extent. To the newer staff, the idea of incorporating things they enjoy outside the realm of Megaten, as well as things that they've seen fans suggest are among the top priority. This is why Kaneko entrusted Hashino to the Persona series when it was decided to revive it with Persona 3. And Kaneko stated he felt that his new role as a producer and coordinator has become necessary for this transitionary period in Shin Megami Tensei and Megami Tensei as a whole. I wanted to briefly touch on some cut contents, just to say in Mega Ten Maniacs we also learned that there were potential bosses that were cut from the game, those being Minotaur, Asterius, Asmodeus, Aizna, and Asher. Shin Megami Tensei's Strange Journey was never meant to be a large-scale project. And from the beginning, Meguro didn't want to disappoint fans with a half-finished product, so this OST became a long one, despite the size of the project. Meguro said he felt the quality of the OST would have improved, however, if the project's scale was larger. Meguro was directed to create music with a sci-fi B-movie as the core of the design. Eiji Ishida asked for something cinematic as well. Meguro cited this as the first time he tried his hand at an orchestral score. For Strange Journey, his initial concept was to use simple compositions of choruses, taiko drums, and wild male shouting. The music in Fornax is the best representation of this idea according to him. <laughs> The opening theme was composed late into production. For this, Meguro tried weaving different parts of the other game's tracks into it to make it representative of the content the game had to offer. Fear was the first song he worked on and drew a bit on Raido's score. A Scorched Nation has a similar atmosphere to a song Meguro once heard on TV. Most songs used an orchestral sound source, but for Prayer, he got to use a new sound library that he had gotten that year, so he had fun mixing tones. In A Frivolous Nation, something interesting to do with tones happened. An unusual source of inspiration for the percussion, where the sound that served as inspiration was actually the sound of the hazard lights difficult to hard. For a squandered nation, Meguro used the male chanting chorus. This sounds a lot like gibberish, but according to Shoji Meguro, he used the theme of the dungeon the song plays in to pull quotes from the Bible to act as lyrics to the song. <laughs> Ron Nation also uses psalms to create the lyrics of the chorus chants. The chanting was made using software called Quantum Leap Symphonic Choirs that was out of print at the time. Meguro bought the software on Yahoo Auctions Japan using Atlas's account, so the buyer was listed as Atlas Co. Limited. And shortly after the game was released, a new version of this out of print software was released much to Meguro's chagrin. 
A Land Remembering Seeds is yet another song that uses the male choir. To explain the process of the software, it allows you to enter lyrics and play them off a keyboard. Meguro used this to create the screaming vocals as well. Chaos theme was meant to have the same atmosphere as Masuda, Gozu Tenno's theme from Shimigami Tensei Nocturne. Hologram's music is supposed to represent the evil thoughts humanity can have before birth. The second part of it is about the sins committed after we are born. For the ending themes, Megara tried to use the same melody but color them differently to align with the ending. A land bringing about life is Shoju Megara's favorite track from Strange Journey. Part of the song is inspired by a song he heard in a commercial, which turned out to be Tchaikovsky's Serenade for a String's first movement. Megara tried asking around the sound team at Alice if they knew the commercial. In the end, he was only able to find out what the song was by spending hours searching for it online. <laughs> The game was released in October of 2009 and was one of the most thoroughly marketed Atlas titles, probably of their entire catalog at the time. The game had a pre-experience party on September 16th of the same year where fans had a chance to play the game for 4 hours at Atlas headquarters. This was available for anyone as long as you applied to attend via Strange Journey's website. After everyone played the game, Kazuma Kaneko and Eiji Ishida answered questions you had. Some questions that were cataloged included, does the protagonist have a source of inspiration for the design? No. Nothing in particular, he was designed based on the stereotype of the impression of an elite soldier. And how many units do you think this game can sell? I don't think it will explode in sales because it's not made for everyone. I want at least 100,000 units. This is no problem if it sells 100,000 units. This is interesting considering the total sales for Japan for the original release ended up being approximately 120,000 units sold, slightly higher than Kaneko's original sales goal. Most of this was units sold within its first week, and the game debuted in the third position in the top selling games for Japan, losing out to Pokemon Heart Gold with 189,000 units sold for that week, and Wii Fit Plus with 152,000 units sold in that week. Other questions included, why has the party size been reduced from the 6 of the SNES era to the 4 from Nocturne onward? With 6 people, the development cycle tends to be overwhelming. If there were 6 controlled characters in battle, it would take a bit longer and change the battle tempo for the worse. In addition, it takes more time to strengthen 5 demons, so we reduce the number to 4 controlled units. Why is the character's stats random when leveling the main character? The difficulty level was raised, so if you set the stat distribution, you can do a full mag build or a full luck build, but it requires you to reset to get your favorite parameters. Outside of the wealth of info and the sneak peek, attendants also received the signed Strange Journey poster. Interestingly, regarding that poster, it remains as the only key art for the game. The only other art used in promotion are the character images created for use in the game. The promotion for Strange Journey didn't end there. Alice held two contests upon its release to incentivize the cultivation of a community. On the Strange Journey forums, yes, that existed, Atlas encouraged players to post their demon builds and they selected their favorites to win prizes. And I honestly couldn't figure out what these prizes were. There was also a mobile site called Strange Journey Mobile, which was downloadable via the Strange Journey website using a QR code. This mobile page featured a news report style info about the game, free digital content, and was eventually accessible via computer. There was also the Strange Journey blog, Lost to Time like many other Atlas blogs, which ended around the time of the release of the game, and seemingly some of the blogs talked about various staff's time working on Strange Journey. Kaneko had an amazing message for fans who were going to play the game. He suggested that it was simply the adult Pokemon, that once you've grown out of Pokemon, you should try Strange Journey. The game also features some merch, Cospa released a mug and some shirts, my favorite being the Bugaboo shirt, which simply says, give human time to figure out what they want. Nightmarishly implying Bugaboo would talk like Smeagol given enough time. In the West, we got little teaser bits. In July of 2009, 
Western fans dug around in the source code of the Japanese site and found Strange Journey info. By noting there was a file named the logo underscore Megami.jpg, the file was removed but a Japanese blog found and posted it. After some time, it was made known it was going to release in the West in spring of 2010 and would ship with a bonus CD boxed in cardboard. Then they learned it would come March 10th and pushed back to March 23rd. The game was also rated M, being one of 11 games for the DS being rated M. Like all useless systems, the ratings board gave the stupidest reasons why only mature audiences can handle Strange Journey. Here are some amazing excerpts. Players use swords, firearms, and magic to kill an assortment of demons, zombies, spirits, and slime creatures. Damage is minimally represented. Fire images, electricity, bullet holes, a flashing screen, and a handful of demons wear outfits that completely expose their breasts. Though these demons have no nipples. Other monsters have phallic shaped heads and torsos, and a couple monsters, example succubus and incubus, have sexual characteristics that are detailed in text, i.e., they visit sleeping men and have sexual intercourse with them, and it ravishes women while they sleep, impregnating them. Profanity, i.e., dipshit and asshole occasionally appears in dialogue. Thank God there are no other games that include any of this stuff. Someone please think of the children. Interestingly, the first print that included the CD OST actually was released as a data CD, so you could not play that in your handy dandy CD player. This meant Atlas USA allowed people to ship their CDs to Atlas for a placement so they could function correctly. In addition to everything described, to promote the game a year after the game was released, Atlas had a campaign to celebrate its initial release. This was a four-wave celebration. The first wave being fans sharing what they found most interesting about Strange Journey, what they would like the future games in Mega 10 to be, and a reaction to Atlas saying thank you for their continued support. These would be posted to Atlasnet and could potentially be published officially by Atlas in some way, and some people who participated would receive gifts for doing so. The prizes included three Strange Journey posters, three Demonica stickers for the DS, three Arthur stickers for the DS, three Diminiho stickers for the DS, six mini Arthur stickers, six mini demon house stickers, and lastly two people won the Strange Journey drama CD. The second campaign included the launch of two Furyu figures, a Thor and Shiva. This claim that the figures were made in celebration of Strange Journey makes very little sense when you consider the design for Thor that got the figure is not the same design that was featured in Strange Journey, making it seem like this was just a coincidental cross promotion with celebration. In addition to all this, you could also participate in a Twitter campaign. Surprisingly, questions could be submitted to Eiji Ishida, MemberX, and Cosmoconico who would reply. People might be familiar with the bot that auto follows anyone who follows it, but that actually wasn't the first Cosmoconico Twitter account. Back into the first anniversary of Strange Journey, you could ask MemberX, Eiji Ishida, and Cosmoconico live using the hashtag Atlas underscore SJ. Their accounts were at Cosma underscore Conico, at AG underscore Score Ishida and at Atlas underscore X. I'm pretty sure member X was Daisuke Narisawa. This hashtag yielded thousands of responses. Most of what Kaneko said is lost in Eiji Ishida and member X's contributions are completely lost as well. But I did find a few things. The reason this stuff is lost, by the way, is because they were completely deleted accounts at some unknown point in time. Interestingly, from the time that this promotion took place, Kaneko merely had 2,383 followers, and the capture from the Wayback Machine shows he replied to about 58 tweets. I have nearly no understanding of how to suss out the context for the 19 tweets that were archived, but here are some things that I thought were interesting. The main line has not had voice acting yet. I may do that in the future. No, Nachi Nozawa has passed away. I wanted him to be the voice of Raido's Konoya. You know, when you grow up, the world isn't really white or black. Megaten will continue to pursue that area. Please continue to play with us. A Mothman plush would be cute. Kanako is often messed up by Rangda, Girimakala, and Tengu. And most of all, there's many Mega Tennis players. Thank you. The third part of the celebration was literally a reveal that the figures would line the UFO catchers in Dawn on Ikibukuro Sunshine Street. Member X went there and attempted to win prizes. They won eight Shiva figures and four Thor. It was announced 10 people from the first event will win these figures as well. This game would be re-released as an enhanced port for the 3DS made in celebration of the 25th anniversary of Shimigami Tensei. While seeming to be an unusual choice, Strange Journey was 
appraised by Atlas staff and Japanese fans as among the best of the franchise, if not the best of the franchise. To walk back a bit, I want to talk about the localization. This was guided by Nick Maragos and Yu Namba. Yu is a longtime Atlas staffer, still employed by Atlas USA, now Atlas West, and Nick is someone who is somewhat infamous for their style of localization, which is to take liberties with the translation that can affect your author's original intent, to some degree. This isn't a video where I even want to discuss the fine details of translating and localizing. In Translating SJ, Nick posted to the former repository of Atlas Faithful, the atlas.com forums, explaining the finer elements himself. So go on and read that archive post yourself. He talks about the level of guesswork while translating things like character names can have. For instance, the way Williams is spelled is Uriyamuzu. There's a level of just figuring out what they're trying to mean by logical deduction. This also extended to the demon names. There's some humorous errors also found in the localization, including Memelef being referred to as Mistress Jimenez. Now I want to discuss the plot and themes. If you don't want to hear some of these mild spoilers for the game, skip ahead to the timestamp section and that part won't have the spoilers probably. Jimenez represents chaos and fuses with a demon which is a classic Megaten trope that is very much associated with Shogo Isogai, who was in charge of writing this game. A soldier of the Blue Jet, he is the only survivor of the Blue Jet which was lost and wrecked. He is in his 20s and is a Hispanic man who has served in an unnamed major power, presumably the US. Jimenez tattoos have meaning as well. Meant to represent his resentment and anger towards the world, he clings to mystical things. That's why he has Jewish mysticism and alchemic figures on his body, as a way of convincing himself of his beliefs. Jimenez can be either a first or a last name, by the way, so it is unclear as to which he is being referred to by. According to Alice, at least. I have literally never heard of anyone named Jimenez, but I looked it up and it's actually a thing, so who knew? Jimenez grew up in a privileged family and grew to be a realist. Because of his disposition, he would often get into fights with other troops when he first joined the army, but this only honed his fighting prowess. In the Schwarzfeld, he meets Bugaboo, a demon-human hybrid experiment, and with whom he forms a kinship seeing Bugaboo as a doppelganger to himself, and projecting an aspect of his personality onto Bugaboo. This made it easier for him to fuse with Bugaboo later in the story, and helped him justify suppressing his emotions. Zelenin is a Russian physicist. According to Alice Staff, her beautiful Slavic white skin and blonde hair are eye-catching, but she's somewhat cold, probably due to the fact she's still in her 20s at a high rank. She's of an abnormally high intelligence and was a scientific research officer of the elves. She witnesses her crewmates murdered by demons and grows to distrust demons as a result. Though, through the coaxing of Mastema, she realizes there's something beyond the science she knows and comes to rely on a few angelic demons. When Zelenin transforms, the image she evokes is actually that of Satan from Shin Megami Tensei 2, along with the law hero's messianic clothing from Shin Megami Tensei 1. Kaneko even intentionally mirrored the pose Satan has in Shin Megami Tensei 2 as well. And the holy pillar form of Zelenin was made with the idea of combining a tuning fork and the cross. Because the song is how she brainwashes people, the idea of using an object that creates resonant notes came to mind. The song is meant to be an earworm in a sense, akin to a virus and representative of how law can use their power to spread religion in this way. The other symbolic meaning is that the tuning fork is a tool, something used for someone else's benefit. And this is also the fate of Zelenin, both as an object of worship and as a pawn for the powers of law. Gore is the captain of the investigation team. He is also the captain of the ship The Red Sprite. He's in his 40s and is a black man from America. He was appointed as head of the team due to his outstanding leadership abilities and his fair and honest leadership style. He's killed in combat against Aureus in Antlia when taken by surprise, and he transcends humanity as the Uber Gestalt. Gore was given the knowledge of Memelef, though he develops his own will through the course of the game. An older original idea was to have Gore fuse with the Red Sprite itself to give him a bit of similar edge to Mr. Otsuki from Shin Megami Tensei If. And now let's talk a little bit about the protagonist. It's worth noting that this character is often called Tarano Hitonari, which is a pun on the phrase 
Tada no Hito Nari, or just an ordinary person. This was also the name given to the character as a nickname by Eiji Ishida. He's also in his late 20s, according to Kaneko, this is a Japanese man who is either half or a quarter Caucasian. He was chosen due to his expert combat skill and his high degree of education. Now let's talk about the Red Sprite. This ship was inspired both by the movie The Day the Earth Caught Fire, a disaster film set in London, and the vehicle, the Landmaster from the B-movie Damnation Alley. Sidebar, but I saw a small model of Damnation Alley's Landmaster at the Peterson Automotive Museum in Los Angeles, but there's a life-size version which you can see for free around the Mojave Desert in California at Gene Winfield's Custom Shop. The idea behind this was to make the adventure into this sci-fi disaster set aboard a ship to some degree. Since the day the Earth caught fire was about the aftermath of nuclear war, this is something Conoco thought about some sort of dream transportation vehicle, a safe space that you can have in this sort of scenario, and it should logically be some sort of car. Lucifer in this game is female, and apparently this is due to some secret reason unnamed but hinted at by Kaneko and Eiji Ishida. The western release calls the form Lucifer, but the Japanese version actually still spells it Lucifer the same way it's been spelled before. It was postulated that if there was a sequel to Strange Journey at some point, Lucifer would return in this female form. In this game, Lucifer likes humans and wants to give them their wisdom. The game's plot and themes are rich, and surprisingly so for a game built with a focus on engaging gameplay above all else. The game centers around the abnormality the Schwartz felt. This is a term that the game describes as coming from the German professor Hammerschmidt in 1933, where it is said, when human capacity exceeds the world's natural capacity, the balance of energy topples. A corrective reaction occurs. It's simplest to think of it as Earth's antibodies attacking humanity. The theory involves a prediction. He believed another dimension, the Schwarzfeld, would appear and a world where intelligent life dwelled. Interestingly, this is not based in reality, and while it seems to be unusual for it to go into fiction to create a history to base the game in, Devil Summoner, another game written by Shogo Isagai, also does this, going even further with a novel with an entirely fictionalized prehistory. Anyway, this anomaly is divided into sectors, each sector has a boss demon that rules the area and is significant because the look of the sectors represent human will. Fragments of human intention accumulated in a sort of information dimension. Though the will of Earth, through the collective consciousness of intelligent life, this human intent willed itself into reality. There are several new demons introduced in Strange Journey, one of which is the goddess Maya. This design was made in an attempt to go back to a more simple style of design that Kaneko had made for Shin Megami Tensei 1. He also wanted to draw her naked originally, but at the same time he wanted to draw her with elegant garb. So he decided to make her wear skin tight armor. Ashura followed a similar formula, but Kaneko saw the music group The Black Eyed Peas and liked the repetition of lines and decided to incorporate that into the design. I couldn't find out what image he was referencing in particular when he was talking about the Black Eyed Peas, unfortunately. According to Kaneko, Mastema is an angel, but he's also evil. The idea behind his design is that he's trying to cover up his evil intentions with white. So he wears a white cape and mask, but underneath he's truly black and thus evil. That's why he also has black wings. The mask also has an air of eroticism. According to Kaneko, none of these are my thoughts. I don't think that black is evil or that masks are erotic inherently. The game's story relies on some unusual concepts. Memelef is the final boss, more or less, and according to the development team, there's no myths or legends about a being known as Memelef. It's instead referring to the concept of the Universal Mother. The idea being that many languages around the world use ma sounds to refer to moms. So ma or mom became Mem and Aleph being one with God, but also the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Mem Aleph is meant to be a part of the earth will that brought the Schwarzfeld anomaly into existence. The theory from which Mem Aleph is derived is called the Gaia theory. Gaia is the earth mother goddess in Greek mythology who is said to have been earth itself. In addition, the game features multiple other mother deities such as Maya and Tiamat. The mothers are considered to be the divinity or motherhood of Mem Aleph born from the outflow of the world. In a sense, the 
the battle depicted in Strange Journey is that of a fight against the world itself. Strange Journey also introduces the idea of the cosmic egg into Megaton. This is an ancient mystical concept that is associated with the Big Bang in a sense. This postulates that the universe begins with a single egg. The game also contains the three wise men. These are meant to represent a counterpart to Memelef. They are the collective consciousness of all intelligent life on Earth, not to be confused with the collective unconsciousness from the Persona series. Now I want to talk about the origins behind the story, and I simply can't do that myself, so I enlisted the help of Kid Capes. Here comes the boy. Hello all, this is Kid Capes, speaking to you from across the Abala multiverse to bring you some hard-hitting Shin Megami Tensei factuals. Today, we're going to be talking about the leaders of the Chaos Faction in Strange Journey. The Mothers. What are they? Where are they? Why are they? But before we can get into all that juicy goodness, we have to talk about the historical and religious basis for these concepts, how they evolved and inspired Strange Journey's lore. The most obvious element at play here is that of the quote-unquote Mother Goddess archetype. It's not exactly easy to give it a simple definition, but they generally share attributes related to sex, fertility, childbirth, or child nurturing. They are also sometimes primordial goddesses, as in, they existed prior to the rest of the universe, or are identified with the Earth itself. It has been used to refer to a fairly broad range of deities. Some examples would include Tiamat or Izanami. It should be noted that this archetype is a relic of 19th century academia, which misunderstood the use of the title Mother given to certain goddesses as a reference to fertility and their ability to nurture the young. In truth, both mother and father were used as titles given to any head god of a specific area, and it served as a reference to their authority. Similar to how the Abrahamic god was called a father, even prior to the rise of Christianity. And I'm hoping you wouldn't assume that like, because he's God the Father, that means he's a massive cock or something. Now another major inspiration is the goddess movement, and that's the goddess with a big G. This is a spiritual movement that gained traction in the 70s, which attempted to combine a series of ancient religious practices from across the world. Naturally, this came with ties to neo-paganism. Their chief claim is that if we look thousands of years ago into prehistoric times, we can assume that many, if not all human societies, had an early form of religion that worshipped a goddess. This goddess is understood to be a deification of the very concept of femininity, possibly having been inspired by ancient man's inability to recognize his place in the reproductive process in regards to how sperm fertilizes an egg. Since these cults would have been worldwide, this means that the goddess goes by many names and sometimes has different roles for specific communities. These are sometimes understood to be avatars of the true goddess, though note, not all modern followers of this movement believe that the goddess is a literal supernatural entity. These points are taken even further and argued to be evidence that prehistoric hunter-gatherer societies would have been egalitarian, since women would have special roles as priestesses. This is compounded with the fact that when looking at a hunter-gatherer society, one could assume that for efficiency, they would have stratified gender roles with women taking up domestic roles with the gathering while men took up the hunting. In this scenario, in order to track down animals, men would be forced to separate from their community for prolonged periods of time, leading to A, men being detached from the family unit, and B, women having to make the socio-political decisions. This would be what we call a matriarchal society as opposed to today's patriarchal ones. The death of these societies is believed to have been caused when humanity began conducting large-scale agriculture and practicing animal husbandry. With the shift away from the nomadic lifestyle, men would now have more active and permanent roles in the community. Furthermore, with the advent of civilization comes the rise of basic forms of private property, including slavery and land ownership. This would lead to the foundation of class structures, which previously would not have existed since everything was owned communally. This would be exacerbated by the conquest of the so-called warlike patriarchal nomadic tribes, which, directly or indirectly, would shatter the culture of matriarchal communities, which are said to be pacifistic and peace-loving. Often included among these warring tribes are the Kurgans from the Russian steppes and the ancient Israelites, with Abrahamic religion being the poster child for patriarchal culture. Eventually, these patriarchal social fixtures would totally overtake matriarchal society, but it's believed that its symbols would still be venerated by the goddess's most avid followers, often in secret, similar to how you can see the faint traces of old gods from long-lost pagan religions in modern Christianity. Now you may have noticed, I've used some very specific language like assume and believe in regards to the subject. And frankly, this topic is much too broad for me to discuss in detail, since the real focus of this video is how these concepts relate to Strange Journey, and not their historical accuracy. In Strange Journey, then, the concepts manifest in the Chaos Alignment, and specifically its leader, Mem Aleph. But before we get into that, we have to explain the metaphysics of Strange Journey. 
If you're familiar with the series, you'll know that demons are a physical manifestation of human thoughts. Normally, this is kept pretty vague and was expanded on in a later entry for the series, SMT4 Apocalypse. But in Strange Journey, it's not very clear. So we're going to look to the explanation by scenario writer Shogo Isogai in his interview from the book Strange Journey Schwarzwell Reminiscences. At the root of everything, there is a being called the Will of the Earth, which is a collection of the thoughts of all intelligent life on the planet. This means two things. First, that it is imperceptible by humans and exists in what Isugai calls the information dimension. And second, that when the thoughts being fed into it change, the will changes with them. Now these thoughts contained within the will exist as crystallized data, meaning that pieces of it represent certain images or symbols. And this data is varied, with some of it having attributes of law and others chaos. Normally, these opposing forces find some sort of equilibrium within the will, but when there is an imbalance, the more prominent symbols can gain the ability to act independently. This can occur when a crisis that jeopardizes the existence of the will itself is caused by the intelligent beings whose thoughts form the will, which in Strange Journey's case is the destruction of the Earth's ecosystem, which will ultimately result in the death of all life on the planet. In response to such a crisis, the will has the ability to activate its internal mechanism for self-preservation and begin to leak into the material world, this being the Schwarzwald. In Strange Journey, the Schwarzwald is a physical manifestation of the power of Mem Aleph, leader of the game's Chaos faction and the central symbol of chaos which gains sentience apart from the will. This connection between the two is literal in the sense that Mem Aleph did actually create the Schwarzwald, but also Mem Aleph herself represents humanity's own chaotic desires. She explains her own motivations like so in the game's Chaos route. I sunk into this land that humans can never know, and watched. All the while, I took in the ideal energy of the creatures of Earth and the humans. But then, destructive energies, giving birth to nothing, began flowing into this land. And as this happened, the Earth began to decay. <sighs> the Earth can no longer survive without reconstruction. To destroy the Earth is to destroy yourself. We must take the lives of those who have forgotten this and bequeath it to those who have not. So in a sentence, we can understand her and the desires she represents as they return to primitive society, living in harmony with the earth. But how they do this is destroy pre-existing society, resulting in the death of millions, maybe even billions of people. This is why the sectors of the Schwarzwald appear as a bitter reflection and critique of the real world. I really want this idea to soak into your heads if you're not familiar with these concepts in relation to the series, so we're going to briefly discuss cycles in SNT. Cycles are a large motif in the series, even referenced in the title. The direct translation being true goddess metempsychosis, and this term metempsychosis refers to an ancient Greek version of reincarnation. While reincarnation is generally understood to apply to humans, and this certainly does occur this way in the series, an important way this presents itself in SMT is on a planetary level, as in both the Earth and its populace will have been reborn a series of times. Often, when a major conflict occurs in Shin Megami Tensei, it will not be the first or last time it has or will occur. An easy example of this would be the conception cycle found in Shin Megami Tensei 3 Nocturne, which is basically a system set up by the Great Will so that when a world dies, the humans left alive are able to define a path for the future and shape the new world based on their philosophy. Across the series, this cycle is often used to symbolize humanity's proclivity to shift from extreme ideology to extreme ideology, these represented by the alignments. We can see this clearly in Shin Megami Tensei 4 with Blasted and Infernal Tokyo, which respectively reflect law and chaos. These are both theoretical universes where their conditions directly lead to revolutions led by the characters of the opposing alignment to overthrow these systems. When we observe how this theme presents itself in Strange Journey, we again have to look towards the Schwarzwell. Now an interesting thing to note about the Schwarzwell is that in universe, it's actually not the first time that it's occurred, and this is likewise the case for the human race. In Reminiscence, Isagai talks about a previous race of humans who possessed technology far more advanced than the current ones, but still weren't able to create a sustainable society. Their actions led to the creation of their own Schwarzwell, and it's mentioned that some of the objects you can see in the game are actually left over from their excursions, including the healing terminals and possibly the moon visible within the Schwarzwell. So now, we can understand the Schwarzwell as part of a larger system, a cycle that is on multiple levels perpetuated by the human race, based on their reckless actions, which go against their own well-being, and their subconscious desires. Isuga compares this process to two different things. On a thematic level, he sees this as the results of the human race's accumulated karma. He goes on to describe it in detail by saying, During the creation process, there was a time when I thought of demons as a liability in human intellectual activities. 
when humans do something wrong, they accumulate regret and repentance. This accumulation must eventually be paid off, as in, it is a system that brings temperance to human beings, which we tend to forget in our modern world, where everything is forgiven. And this ties into the second way he views the Schwarzwald, as a sort of planetary homeostasis. Now I'm sure it's been a minute since most of us took high school biology, so this is its definition given in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Any self-regulating process by which biological systems tend to maintain stability while adjusting to conditions that are optimal for survival. This obviously relating to how the Schwarzwald is basically an internal process used to even out human tendency. This idea was inspired by a real-life ecological hypothesis called the Gaia Principle, which was conceptualized by chemist James Lovelock and microbiologist Lynn Margulis. Lovelock gives a short overview of his hypothesis in his paper, Geophysiology, the Science of Gaia. The Gaia hypothesis postulates that the climate and chemical composition of the Earth's surface environment is, and has been, regulated at a state tolerable for the biota. This notion was introduced in 1972 and 1973. The wording of these early papers was sometimes poetic rather than scientific, but Gaia has matured. It might be better stated as a theory that views the evolution of the biota and their material environment as a single, tightly coupled process with the self-regulation of climate and chemistry as an emergent property. Essentially, Lovelock believed that the Earth should be viewed in the context that all life and the natural processes that occur on the planet work together and form a self-regulating body, which should be thought of similar to that of a living being, and should therefore be called a superorganism. Now, if you're at all familiar with this franchise, you heard me say Gaia, and you probably said to yourself, oh, that's a thing I know, I clapped. But for those who aren't, you may know Gaia as the name of the Greek personification of the Earth, the definitive Earth Mother, but that's not really the important bit here. This use of the name Gaia brings to mind Shin Megami Tensei's Cult of Gaia. This group is present in some form throughout most of mainline s &T, and they serve as a series chaos representatives. They believe human society was corrupted by a bit, the god of law, who in a bit for power sealed away many ancient, powerful gods, demonizing them in the process. The ultimate goal of the Cult of Gaia is the revival of these old gods, so humans can return to an era where they lived in tandem with the demons and in harmony with the earth. This will be a world of survival of the fittest, which they view as a return to man's natural state. I should mention here that Isogai does note that he took care to make differences between Gaianism, as in the cult's religion, and the Gaia philosophy, as in the hypothesis, in relation to Memalif and the Schwarzwald. But it's interesting to note that in SMT4, when you visit the Tsukiji Hoganji Gaian temple, there is a giant statue of Memalif visible in the background. Furthermore, when we look closely, we can find parallels between the Schwarzwald and the setting of Nocturne, the Vortex world. Like the Schwarzwald, it's explicitly built up to be a realm embodying chaos. At the start of the game, we are shown the Gaian prophecy that foretells the advent of the Vortex world called the Moroku Sutra, which can be seen in the intro for the original and Chronicles editions of Nocturne. Here, it refers to the Vortex world as the Taizo, referring to the Taizo Kai Mandala, which is essentially a Buddhist metaphor for growth. The thing about this is that Taizo directly translates to womb, and this, along with Nocturne's motif of birth, maps on to SJ's later theme of motherhood, though it's hard to tell how intentional this relation is. If you're interested in hearing me go a little further in depth on Nocturne, check out my video, SMT Theology, Nocturne, Conception in the Womb. And yes, I am plugging it shamelessly. Please subscribe. Now that we've discussed a little about the Earth and birth in the larger context of the series, and specifically Strange Journey, we can start talking directly about Mem Aleph, who is like the linchpin for everything we've discussed so far. First, let's take a look at this quote by writer Nobuyuki Shiyoda from the SMT 25th anniversary book, Megaten Maniacs, which says, there is no myth or legend that mentions Mem Aleph by name. It is closer to the universal concept of mother, which is the prototype for the earth mother deities of various myths. In many languages around the world, the sound ma often refers to the mother, as in Japan, where the mother is called mama. If you break down Ma into the alphabet, you get M and A, and if you call M Mem and A Aleph, you get Mem Aleph. So what we see here is that Mem Aleph doesn't really represent a specific goddess, but more so what we can call the archetypal mother goddess, which is identical to how some in the goddess movement interpret their prehistoric goddess. Furthermore, this view is similar to how Kazuma Kaneko, the series' previous designer, described how he saw the Abrahamic god in a Q&A for a guidebook made for the English release of Nocturne. He says, there are many mysterious common motifs, like the flood legend in mythology, so I like to investigate mythology from all around the world. For instance, the aforementioned flood legend, the creation process at the beginning of the universe, a hero going on a journey to overcome trials, 
and sights at the end of the world, etc, etc. It's almost like a shared memory of the events that happened in ancient times has remained to make people draw up the same motifs. One way of thinking is that there was one mythology in the ancient past, and then, as the races moved and the continents drifted, they customized it to the special geography and topography of where they lived, until we got the unique region myths we know today. However, the basis is the same, so even though there are differences in these myths due to geography, topography, and culture, their motif and theme remain very similar. And when I thought about which mythology served as the basis, I concluded that it was the Old Testament. Which means, the god of the Old Testament is the basis for all the gods around the world, from a folklorist standpoint. This parallel can be taken further when we consider the Shinto concept of Bunrei and how this has been applied to the Shin Megami Tensei series. Now for a little background, in Shintoism, a god's authority is absolute, in that even when a god is divided, in order for the deity to be enshrined in a new area, the authority that the new shrine holds is equal to that of the original. This newly separated divine spirit that resides in the new shrine is what's called a Bunrei. An easy way to think of this would be in terms of computer data. If you have a file and you copy paste it to create a duplicate in another folder, it does not lessen the quality of the original. This concept is first overtly seen in the Shin Megami Tensei series in the end of SMT2, the Megado arc, and is translated as Avatar. Here, you meet three of <laughs> Bunrei, Shaddai, Elohim, and Sabaoth, who challenge you for defying the will of the God of Law. These names are all references to titles used for the Abrahamic God in the Bible, and some are arguably different interpretations or versions of him to different people at different times. In Mem Aleph's case, her Bunrei are the other mothers, Ouroboros Maya, Tiamat, and Maya. While Mem Aleph represents an archetypal goddess, these demons represent a localized version of the uppercase G goddess. In reminiscence, Shogo Isagai explains this as being due to Mem Aleph being a more abstract deity, while the mothers are more concrete and representative of human thought. This also being applicable to the Schwarzwald as a whole. The deeper you go into it, the more foreign to humanity it is. Isagai cites the inspiration for this being what he calls the socialization of deities, which essentially refers to the evolution of religion over time with human civilization, from pantheism to polytheism and monotheism. All of this may explain why, at the end of the game, when you first meet Mammaloth, humans don't have the ability to perceive her. Now going back to the concept of an archetypal god, this is what we in the business call hyperdiffusionism, which is an anthropological view that many, if not all worldwide cultures, are derived from a single ancient culture. While this is definitely ahistorical, it can lead to some interesting interpretations. For example, Mammaloth. There are a good amount of details in her design that come together from different cultures to form one cohesive composite figure, and we're going to discuss some of them right now. The most obvious part of her design are the parallels you can find between her and <laughs> We've already discussed this a bit earlier, but there are other facets, like her gold coloring, the prominence of her head, that she's a creator goddess, and the fact that her name is in Hebrew. But if we're going to go deeper, we need to talk about her name in closer detail. Mem and Aleph are respectively the 13th and 1st letters of the Hebrew Abjad, and are its equivalent for the letters M and A. Side note, Abjads are basically just alphabets without vowels. That's why, when you see the tetragram, the four letters that make up the name of the Hebrew God, it's YHVH. You're supposed to infer the vowels from that. This example actually ties into the larger point I'm making about Mem Aleph. Unlike how most of us understand letters and words to be largely arbitrary and entirely dependent on the social utility, in Jewish mysticism, also known as Kabbalah, letters are metaphysical, literally acting as the building blocks of reality. This calls to mind Genesis 1-3, then God said, let there be light, and this is not a coincidence. He spoke, and so it was. This line of thought involves a belief of real supernatural power in the mere expression of words, and this was a fairly common religious take across that region, which you can find examples of in the Babylonian Enuma Elish and the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And this is not the only meaning we can take from the name Mem Aleph. If her name can also be read as the letters M-A, and therefore the word Ma, then rather than reading it as shorthand for mother, we can read it in the Japanese context in which the word Ma actually means demon. It's a shortening of the word Akuma, which is itself derived from the Sanskrit word Mara, the personification of desire that tries to tempt the Buddha and keep him from enlightenment. The word Ma is also used in a Christian sense to refer to the devil. But in short, we can understand Mem Aleph to simultaneously refer to both mother and demon. Another prominent aspect of this design is her pose. This is likely a reference to that of the reclining Buddha, which represents Siddhartha Buddha on his deathbed just before he enters Parinirvana. To explain in short, 
If we understand nirvana as enlightenment, in the sense of understanding the true nature of existence and no longer being tethered to the samsara, the cycle of reincarnation, then para-nirvana is total separation from the samsara through death, becoming one with the universe. This distinction is important because we have to recognize that while the Buddha are enlightened, they still directly participate in events within the samsara, but this is not the case under para-nirvana. We can actually see this in the game itself as well. In the chaos route, Mem Aleph sacrifices herself to help pave the way for the player to create the desired world, saying, I shall disappear, but only for a short while. When the earth has been restored, I will be there. But when you actually achieve the ending, she's not physically present, or at the very least, isn't actually shown. And in the law and neutral endings, when she turns into empty Mem Aleph, she says, I have become naked power, casting off form, casting off reason, casting off my future. My sole desire is to crush your spirits into atoms and disappear into the air. So I think, we can pretty safely say that in the chaos ending, she's not referring to being physically present, but spiritually, since this theme appears to be consistent. This theme of enlightenment is also reflected in her third eye. Now you may be vaguely familiar with this concept through pop culture, but it's a symbol that originates in Hinduism as the Ajna Chakra, that denotes perception beyond the physical. It may be worth noting that a major figure related to the third eye motif in Hinduism is Shiva, one of the Hindu triumvirate, which collectively work to create, maintain, and destroy the universe. Shiva's specific role is to destroy, but in this context, it's not seen as a bad thing. It's understood as a necessary part of the cycle so the world can be created anew. We can sort of map this onto Mem Aleph's role in the game, since she wants to destroy humanity and force them to evolve so they can live in harmony with the Earth. Now that we've discussed the design in more depth, let's backtrack a little bit to the earlier comment by Nobuyuki Shiyoda. There is no myth or legend that mentions Mem Aleph by name. One may take this to mean that Mem Aleph is Atlas's original character, but that's not actually true we can trace her back to a book called The Woman's Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets by Barbara G. Walker. If you're familiar with Erica's blog, you may have heard of this before. In this book, Walker promotes a lot of the ideas I discussed earlier regarding the goddess movement, and that by itself would mean it flirts with misinformation, but on top of that, seemed to be entirely fabricated by Walker herself. The sheer volume of just lies leads me to believe that this book actively engages in misdirection and historical revisionism to prove its point. So as you hear me explain the descriptions in this book, I implore you to stay cognizant of the fact that not a single thing I quote from her should be taken as historical. Also, as we go further in this video, I'll be referring to the women's encyclopedia as the WE, just so you know. That said, it's still very important to examine its text in the context of Strange Journey, because if there's any single text we can source much of its mythos from regarding the mothers, it's this. We know this because not only is Mem Aleph a creation of Walker, but some of the descriptions given for the mothers in Megatenomaniacs and Reminiscence are very similar to their respective ones from the encyclopedia, and almost word for word in Mem Aleph's case. I say all this to say that we can look at the encyclopedia to try to find a deeper explanation for some of the mythological depictions found in Strange Journey. Consider that some of its quote-unquote mothers aren't even mothers in their own myths, much less mother goddesses. Let's go in order and start with Ouroboros Maya. Traditionally speaking, an Ouroboros is a Greek symbol depicting a snake eating its own tail. It represents infinity, or more specifically, the eternal cycle of life and death, referred to by the Greeks as transmigration. This is due to snakes sometimes being viewed as immortal because of their ability to shed skins. Likewise, serpents have often represented chaos. An obvious example is the serpent from the Garden of Eden that tricked Eve and led to the fall of mankind in the Bible. But another good example is the great serpent Apophis, or Apep, from Egyptian mythology who stood against the sun god Ra and his servant Seth on their daily journey across the sky. In fact, one of Apep's epithets was World Encircler, which is another motif you can see across some world cultures, such as the Norse with the giant serpent Jormungandr, which is said to battle against the gods on the day of Ragnarok. Walker herself relates Ouroboros and Apep in his entry saying, medieval scholars confuse their symbols when trying to uncover the secrets of the Philosopher's Stone. This is a reference to the religion Hermeticism, which has its origins somewhere around 100 CE. It's focused on a figure named Hermes Trismegistus, who was essentially a fusion of the Greek god Hermes and the Egyptian god Toth. And as early as the Ptolemaic era, the Greeks themselves understood the gods to be equivalent. This relation is made more clear in Ouroboros' own entry, which describes it as the Greek name of the Hermetic world serpent. It is important because it establishes Walker's connection between Ouroboros and the Greek god Hermes, which is relevant in two distinct ways. The first is that this relation to the god Hermes in turn connects us to his mother and member of the Pleiades, Maya. This being why Strange Journey's version of Ouroboros is called Ouroboros Maya, 
In his entry for Serpent, the W.E. states that the Ageless Serpent was identified with the Great Goddess herself. This connection is made clearer in the entry for Maya with an Eye, which relates the Greek nymph to an unnamed goddess of Maytime festivals, possibly referring to the Roman goddess Flora and the festival of Floralia, which Walker describes as being centered around a theme of rebirth. Walker also credits Maya for granting Hermes' feminine wisdom, since as her child, he was once part of her, which may play into her takes on Hermeticism that we'll talk about shortly. Now onto the second aspect of this connection, and I think this one is very interesting, because contrary to what you would assume, with Ouroboros' role as a mother, here, the symbol is more specifically identified with Hermes than his mother Maya. In the W.E.'s entry for Hermes, Walker alleges that the Gnostics viewed Hermes as a personification of the world serpent, ruler of time, who coiled around the terrestrial egg, and would go on to directly relate the figures, saying the Gnostics viewed the Druidic Ouroboros as the great snake Hermes. This connection between Hermes and snake imagery is further through the Caduceus, Hermes' winged staff encircled by two snakes, and its usage in alchemical circles. We've already discussed in passing the importance that Walker gives the Ouroboros to Hermeticism and therefore alchemy via the Philosopher's Stone, but I want to add that this could also be the mythological basis for a short scene held in Sector E. It shows Ouroboros' powers being maintained by the demons Mandrake, Quansha, Zlarhuns, and Basilisk, which respectively call themselves the Child, the Skull, the Frog, and the Dragon. These vaguely resemble the Magnum Opus, Latin for great work, which is the alchemical process for creating a Philosopher's Stone. It includes four stages, Negrito, the Blackening, Albedo, the Whitening, Citrinitis, the Yellowing, and Rubido, the Reddening. That said, I want to be clear here that these stages don't map onto the demons cleanly, and the evidence for this is entirely circumstantial, so this may not be the case. I could be wrong, who knows? If you have any ideas or thoughts on what this might be, leave a comment. Another major element that plays into this is how Walker emphasizes the prevalence of intersexual symbolism, meaning figures with both masculine and feminine sexual characteristics in its relation to Hermes. Hermaphrodite itself is a word named after the Greek god Hermaphroditus, who Walker also conflates with Hermes. She continues to stress these themes for Hermeticism in Hermes' entry, saying, Hermetic symbolism usually called the serpents male and female, for the real secret of Hermetic power was androgyny. In alchemy in its own entry, referencing the masculine sun, the feminine moon, and the rebus, a figure with overt intersexual themes. Looking at all this information together, my reading of this is that in Strange Journey, Ouroboros Maya is representing something like the intersexual aspect of Hermes, or that the name Ouroboros Maya itself is pointing to how the figure is meant to represent both Maya and Hermes at the same time, like Maya identifying with Hermes or vice versa. If we read this as like a more masculine version of Maya, it would make sense why Ouroboros would be the lowest ranked mother, especially considering that in Maya's WE entry, Walker posits that Maya with an I is essentially a Western version of Maya with a Y, the mother of the historical Buddha, and mentions them as parallel virgins who birth an enlightened one. We're going to talk more about Maya with a Y later in her own section, but I just want to note that maybe we can understand Ouroboros as the lesser, more masculine Maya with an I, while Maya with a Y is strictly feminine. Moving on to the second mother, Tiamat, we find her origins in a Babylonian creation myth, the Enuma Elish. Here, Tiamat is described as the primordial waters of chaos that birthed the first generation of gods, Lamu and Lahamu, with her partner Apsu. In fact, the name Tiamat is believed by scholars to be derived from the Akkadian word Tamtu, meaning sea. Possibly due to this, there is a misconception that Tiamat was understood to be a sea serpent or a dragon, but modern scholarship shows that Tiamat's depiction was largely inconsistent and ranged from literally being a body of water to being a monster with an assortment of animalistic body parts. However, this misunderstanding reflects on not only the aforementioned snake imagery, but also Tiamat's placement in the Drake race of demons. Furthermore, it should be said that Tiamat herself was an invention of the Enuma Elish, and she has a scant presence outside of it. However, there is a very different picture painted by the entry for Tiamat in the WE. We find that Walker erroneously sources the etymology behind Tiamat to Diamater, meaning Great Mother, and mentions her as being the single deity who separated the heavens from the earth, citing it as a feat later plagiarized by the ancient Jews, or the Yahwists, who would use it to describe their god. Furthermore, Walker equates the primordial waters to a universal womb, and we can see references to this in Strange Journey itself, when Ouroboros describes humanity as a lamentable mistake birthed by the waters of life, and later, when Mem Aleph describes herself as the mother who lives in the depths of the waters of thought, giving birth to life on earth. 
Walker also claims that in Southern Arabia, the goddess Ishtar took on some of the attributes of Tiamat. And while this may not be inspired by the WE, in Shin Megami Tensei 2, Ishtar is needed to restore the waters of harvest in Bina, and her return allows new demons to be born in the Abyss. Bina, in Kabbalistic thought, represents the understanding of God, and together with Hakma, or the wisdom of God, form the Tree of Life's higher union, with Hakma acting as the masculine father, and Bina as the feminine mother. Also note that in SMT2, Ishtar's demon race is Lady, but in the Japanese, it's called Jiboshin, which directly translates to Earth Mother. Now what makes all of this so funny is that not only was Walker wrong in the fact that Tiamat was not widely worshipped, not only was the distinct Southern Arabian version of Ishtar a male deity named Ashtar, but also Ishtar is not even seen as a quote unquote mother goddess in this sense in the first place. It's just a cascade of misinformation. It gets overwhelming sometimes. But regardless, Tiamat herself has a vaguely similar role in Strange Journey, wherein Sector F, she rebirths the demons Morax, Mitra, Horkos, and Asura into their true forms, Moloch, Mithras, Orcus, and Asherah. Isugai also reflects on Tiamat being a specifically important mother among the three of them saying, quote, she took the lead. This may have to do with the fact that between them, Tiamat is the only one who is actually referenced as a mother in her myths of origin, and could be why Tiamat is the mother who is the most motherly, with an army of her demon children surrounding her and serving her every beck and call. Finally, we have the third mother, Maya. The word Maya is taken from Sanskrit and directly translates to illusion or magic, think like a stage magician. This word actually has a strong meaning in Hindu philosophy. In the Advaita Vedanta school of thought, Maya is the veil that closes humanity's eyes to the Brahman, the true nature of reality which can only be defined by its infinite and indescribable nature. Furthermore, Advaita Vedanta practices a form of non-dualism, which means that they believe that all of reality is ultimately Brahman. Therefore, belief in any subject being distinct from this whole in any way would be considered Maya. However, as we mentioned earlier in Ouroboros' section, Walker conflates the Hindu concept of Maya with Maya Devi, the mother of the historical Buddha. Now what makes this interesting is that in Strange Journey Reminiscence, this same conflation is made and they actually go further in detail, saying, The world we see now appears to be real, but it is an illusion, different from reality, a magical barrier put up by Brahman. Maya wraps us warmly in her bosom, but at the same time, she distracts us from the truth that we should know, that's motherhood. This totally reframes Maya from something negative that keeps humankind trapped within the cycle to something positive. And if you paid attention, you may have noticed that this is actually something Maya herself touches on in the game. She says, I too once had a dream, a dream where humans had a prosperous future. That is because I entered their consciousnesses and brought forth that prosperity. This land of illusions is also the birthplace of the future. But what do the humans show me now? Dreams of decay, rot, destruction, Humans have lost the power in their dreams, and can no longer build a beautiful future. Now, I can't tell you what exactly Atlas was trying to go for in twisting his definition, but my take is that in Shin Megami Tensei, chaos generally idealizes change and individualism. This often takes shape in its critiques of law, since it often involves humanity trying to reach some sort of cohesion, creating social stagnancy in order to obtain peace. So if we think about it in this lens, chaos would probably hate the concept of Brahman, since it's an unchanging absolute. However, I do think it's kind of odd to frame Brahman this way, while also using imagery for Para Nirvana for Mem Aleph. They seem to have their views on Nirvana clashing. That said, this is more of a nitpick. These figures represent a mesh of human belief, so I don't think they need to represent existing religion exactly. That said, going back to the WE, Walker describes Maya as title of the Virgin Kali as the creatress of earthly appearances, i.e. all things made of matter and perceptible to the senses so it's possible that they just adapted its usage directly. That said, this entry gives us another interesting tidbit. The use of Kali here refers to the Hindu goddess of destruction and wife of Shiva. Walker describes Kali as the basic archetypal image of the birth and death mother, simultaneously womb and tomb, and claims that the Hindu triumvirate that rules over creation, preservation, and destruction that I spoke of earlier had actually taken over functions that originally belonged to Kali. Here, invoking the neo-pagan trope, often seen as the maiden or the virgin, the mother, and the crone. This mention of Kali is important because it also helps tie together a lot of the concepts we've already discussed. If you recall, when we talked about Tiamat, I described her as the primordial waters of chaos. Walker relates this to the term Tohu wa Bohu from Genesis 1-2, meaning formless, describing the state of the earth prior to creation. She claims this to be derived from a quote-unquote general Asiatic belief that the waters of the goddess held all potentiality and was itself 
tied to the concept of reincarnation cycles. And in Kali's own entry, Tohu Wabohu is referenced as one of her forms. She goes further to define chaos as the goddess herself in her state of eternal flux, when the fluid of her womb was not yet clotted into the formative state of the solid world. And this is further attested in Kali's entry, when it describes Tohu Wabohu as the primal deep and the menstrual ocean of blood at creation. For me, this brings to mind something Kaneko said in the Nocturne Guide interview I mentioned earlier, where he explained one of the inspirations behind the Vortex world being the Hanya Shingyo, a Buddhist scripture on the nature of emptiness. The Vortex world, as we said earlier, being based around the concept of chaos, which is defined by its malleable nature that is solidified by the will of the reason holder, and even features a cosmic egg in the form of Kagatsuchi, the cosmic egg being a sexual allegory to creation, which Walker describes as mystical symbol of the creatress, whose world egg contained the universe in embryo. Something worth noting here is to Walker, chaos at large is given roles regarding both birth and death due to her view of it being the definitive form of the divine feminine. So when we look at her entry for chaos, we see it is also strongly related to that of Doomsday. And the first thing Walker mentions in its entry is to cite its origin to that of the Hindu Kali Yuga. The Kali Yuga is the last age of four during which humanity will be at the peak of its immorality and is said to end with the fight between the final avatar of Vishnu, Kalki, and the demon Kali. Not to be confused with the goddess Kali, though that won't stop Walker. After which, Kalki will eradicate wickedness from the earth, completing the cycle, and the first age, the Satya Yuga, will begin again. Walker takes this story and interprets the demon Kali as being the goddess, while at the same time, merging his narrative role with Kalki's, saying, Mother turns destroyer, because the race of men become violent and sinful, failing to perceive deity in the feminine principle. When Kali's doomsday arrived, the gods would slay each other, earth would be overwhelmed by fire and flood, the goddess would swallow up everything and unmake it, returning to her primordial state of formless chaos, as she was before creation. All beings would enter her, because she devours all existence. After a time that could not be counted, because even time was destroyed, Kali would give birth to a new universe. With the context we've gained so far, this section serves as a microcosm of the game itself. Here, we can see the influences on the narrative of Strange Journey and how strong the parallels to Mam Aleph are. It simultaneously covers the theme of rebirth, the return to an age of old, the destructive mother, and with it, we can even visualize the Schwarzwald swallowing the earth and the scarred world that it culminates in in the chaos ending. Now, I'll end with this, because I've been talking for a long time. Though Strange Journey gives us a new set of major characters in the form of Mem Aleph and the Mothers, the themes that these figures embody fit neatly within the pre-established lore of the series when looking at elements like the Cult of Gaia in the Vortex world, and they all come together to form a new and interesting take on chaos. If you're interested in these topics, I'm going to have a list of sources with selected reading for you guys to go through, including the book I spoke about at length, The Women's Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets. And now that I mention it, I want to note that while SMT does have this image of accurately depicting religion, I don't think using faulty sources as an inspiration is necessarily a bad thing, or that Atlas did something wrong for using it, though I do believe they should be more upfront about this when discussing it outside the context of the game. Okay, that's all I got. I'm off my soapbox now. This has been Kid Capes. You can find me at my YouTube channel of the same name, where I do whatever I like. At the moment, it's SMT. I'll hand it back to LaRue now. Thanks for having me. Internally, this game was loved, not only for its new take on the Mega Ten formula and concepts, but for considering new fans and presenting an intense challenge. Ashida said there are many times he wanted to throw his DS when the boss wiped his party because it was a roster of demons that weren't suited for the challenge, but he always felt it was his fault when this would happen. The game spawned a drama CD and fond memories. Looking at reviews from its release back in 2009, the reception was largely positive. I pulled a review that best exemplifies the positive general consensus. The ultimate RPG for adults. Since the hardware of the DS, I was worried that it wouldn't feel like a masterpiece like Dragon Quest IX, but the speculation was dispelled, and it is a masterpiece suitable for succeeding the crown of Shin Megami Tensei. First of all, 
The music you hear will arouse the anxiety and despair, hope and curiosity of the adventure that is about to begin. And with the addition of a story, you'll be drawn into the world of the game before you know it. If you like Kaneko's illustrations of the Shimagami Tensei series, the worldview and graphics are perfect. The difficulty level of the battle is medium to high, so it is a type that you will proceed slowly. People from Persona and Raido may be frustrated by the overly obstructive and heavy content and the difficulty level, but beyond that, the game is sure to be satisfying. I was wondering if there was any chance that this could live up to Shin Megami Tensei 1 and 2, and Atlas managed to do it. And here's a negative reception review with an equal amount of people agreeing. I couldn't quite understand what was interesting. Reason equals old fashioned graphics. It is said that human beings will be destroyed at the beginning of the story, but since the stage of the game is the North Pole or Antarctic, there is no tension at all. It is good to be able to make friends with the demons in conversation, but new skills even if you level up is boring because I don't remember things like that. And I don't feel like I've become stronger even if I level up because it doesn't evolve like that. I didn't like it because I couldn't sort the parameters by myself even if the main character leveled up. I bought it because it was highly rated, but honestly, it wasn't interesting. In a nutshell, it's just a grinding game. It got decent reviews except with GameSpot, which decided to give it only a 6 out of 10. They also personally hurt me with this line. Longtime Mega 10 devotees may be thankful for its return to the first person dungeon crawling roots of the series, but those expecting this to live up to the superb Persona 4 or Devil Survivor will be disappointed with the outdated gameplay, straightforward combat, and boring exploration of Strange Journey. The game didn't really get that much pomp or celebration after the western release and would leave the lips of most for a time until 2017. 2017 was the 25th anniversary of Shin Megami Tensei's first release. This resulted in many aspects of celebration, from concerts to acrylic garbage to fine wine. There was quite a bit for fans to enjoy. The crowning jewel, however, was Shin Megami Tensei Strange Journey Redux. First revealed as Shin Megami Tensei HD, Redux isn't simply a port of the game from DS to 3DS, but actively seeks to change or enhance elements of the game. The game saw the return of a few staff, but its roster of participants lacked two of the most integral aspects of the original game's design, Kazuma Kaneko and Shogo Isogai. Isogai being celebrated even beyond Kaneko as being an expert of mythology and history and being the second longest stayed staff at Atlas, who wrote a majority of the scenario of the original with help from Kazuyuki Yamai and Tatsuya Watanabe. Now, the new content is written by Yo Haruki and Hirono Akutsu. Haruki's experience with Atlas was mostly with the Langrisser series and previous SMT involvement was with Devil Survivor as the lead scenario writer. Tokyo Mirage Sessions, and Devil Survivor 2 Record Breaker. Akutsu's only other credit is Tokyo Mirage Sessions. Kaneko did not provide any input to the gameplay changes, the story tweaks, or anything else about this project. Actually, a change in the staff credits provide insight to what Redux ended up being, because Redux is really not the same game as Strange Journey, where the original credits and interviews, books, blogs, and articles I use as research material for this documentary cite Kaneko as the person who provides the ideas, the original concept and the character design, you actually don't see him as a major part of the credits in Redux. Instead, Ishida is credited for the original concept of the new scenario, Dory is credited for the new demon designs, Akira Odegaki is credited for the character refinement and sub-character design, Odegaki's designed characters for Trauma Team and worked for Trauma Center Under the Knife, 2 and New Blood, and worked on some key art for Shin Megami Tensei 4, if you're not familiar with who that is. And Kaneko's credit is nearly at the very end of the role, cited as the scenario original concept and series demon design shared with Megumi Shiraishi. The reasons for this placement could be many things, but suffice to say this game puts an emphasis on crediting the people who worked on the new aspects of the game and just thanks the people who did work previous that was the foundation for this remaster. During all interviews, Eiji Ishida puts a lot of emphasis on the changes, of which there are a lot. So here are some of them. The art for all human characters except Alex are drawn or redrawn by Akira Odegaki. New demons added both demons from the series before and newly designed demons from Masayuki Doi including Anahita, Demeter, 
Zeus and, and Eamon, new sub apps, new animated scenes, Japanese voice acting, a new UI, a skill set called Commander Skills, increase in the number of demons that can be held, skills can now be selected when using demon sources, the ability to see what a skill will mutate into before deciding to allow it, special fusions can be done straight from the demon compendium, sub apps, player level, and map progression now carry over to New Game Plus, swapping demons in combat now takes effect in one turn instead of two, the ability to see the success rate of retreating from battle, heals from the red sprite are now free, the ability to look at other floors of the dungeons besides the one that you're on currently, battle animations can now be double sped or skipped entirely, DLC including training day which boosts EXP and more and more which gives the player more forma from former searches, maka shower which allows for easier maka access, Former Search X, which allows for demon incenses to be found in former searches. DLC items like the Growth Vest, which increases EXP gain from battle. Billiken Vest, which increases Maka gain from battle. Demon Killing Pack, which includes a pistol and sword. Safe Journey Pack, which includes jewels, chakra drops, chakra pots, great chakras, light balls, and return balls. And Mobile Team Support Pack, which provides EXP items, money items, and demon incenses. There was also a limited edition for Strange Journey Redux. This included a large OST featuring a mainline series and rarities set and new arranged tracks and also a book called the Megaten Maniacs which chronicles the growth and development of the entire Megaten franchise, new EX missions, and some gameplay changes including a new dungeon and new ending. Now this enhanced port was very hyped up, featuring a collaboration with the Code of Joker series, the manga, Deathtimate, Megami Tensei, Deep Strange Journey, another report, a designer production of the Demonica suit in the form of a jacket, a mystery solving escape room, and a prequel Metrovania title developed by Ladybug, first teased as a joke, but then released for free for a short time, along with the popularity polls, live streams, and special reproduction of the Demonica helmet on display at the Tokyo Game Show of that year. The game went to sell around 60,000 units in Japan and in the West went somewhat under the radar. With me personally being able to buy extra copies at Target and Best Buy on clearance within only a couple of months after its release. With Redux, Atlas wanted players who played the original game to face new challenges, so they added the new dungeon, a new story with new characters. The story branches into three new endings. Ishida hoped that fans of the original would be shocked by the character of Alex and fascinated by her as well. To improve the game and increase the immersion, they added the bust up portraits of all characters who did not have portraits in the game originally. They also added voice acting to make scenes even more dramatic and engaging. The commander skills were added to increase the tempo of combat. The UI was changed to reduce the number of button inputs the player needed to enter. Sprinting was also added to speed up the game as well. Ishida stated that you'd have to compare them side by side to notice it. But once you get your hands on the remake, there are so many quality of life improvements that you'll find it hard to return to the original game. They also added the ability to change the difficulty at will to increase the pace so fans can play at ease, so fans can switch to easy when they want to progress faster. Ishida cited the field save function as being one of the best improvements in the game, stating it vastly improved the gameplay experience so the player would never have to suffer a major loss due to a party wipe. This is also why there's a sub app to prevent you from reaching a game over when you die in battle. When asked why they chose to remake a relatively recent game, yes, unusually enough, the interviewer and Ishida use remake, not remaster, to refer to this game. I believe this is a language barrier thing, as they refer to many games that are not remakes as remakes within Atlas culture. Ishida said they wanted SJ to be more widely known and that they'd consider a sequel if the enhanced port sold well. The content and changes to the game were mostly made with the player in mind, trying to add more enjoyment and challenge to the original fans. The second aspect was to try and make the game a lot easier to prospective new players and attract them to the game's world. Not much from the planning stages of the remake was cut besides an idea to make a new fusion rule to make the game a little more complex. Now the reception for this game is a bit divisive, due in part to the gameplay changes, the art changes, the narrative changes, and the concern about Cosmo Conoco's legacy. In a couple other videos, I've touched on the idea that Conoco and Atlas may not possibly be on good terms, and this has affected the perception of this game in particular. To simply state it, Strange Journey, as described by Conoco and Ishida, was a frustratingly difficult game that would challenge you to experiment, gamble, 
and voice a concern about humanity's relationship with the planet and if our nature was salvageable or if in fact we were a plague or parasite that the earth was suffering from. Strange Journey Redux relishes in making the game as easy and simple for the player as possible, while changing this narrative to be more about the mystery of this new character and how she relates to the protagonist. And the simplicity and ease extends to the plot, as the original release took from its inspirations and provided a rough and serious and depressing outlook, while Redux actually adds endings that could be seen as happy for the most part, and veering further into sci-fi but not in that same the Thing, Event Horizon style of sci-fi that the original had. Now I've largely avoided talking about the plot in detail because in a perfect world, after watching this video you'd play both Strange Journey and Strange Journey Redux. This video isn't a platform for me to suggest one is better than the other. For the benefit of the video, I replayed both simultaneously dungeon to dungeon. I would alternate between the two versions as I finished one of the dungeons to experience the differences and to make note of how it impacted the player experience. Now, I don't think that Strange Journey Redux is a terrible player experience. From what I've gathered, it's largely an okay game. It's not nearly the same sort of game that I would have enjoyed as many aspects from the original that I enjoyed are either removed or changed. Strange Journey Redux, to put it simply, isn't a terrible experience, but it's significantly less engaging. Considering that roster of changes and the emphasis of making the game easier and simpler for new fans, it's not a bold claim to suggest that the game takes agency away from the player. There's a dubious aspect of the concept of quality of life, because this, in theory, should enhance the gameplay experience. For instance, dashing in Strange Journey is a good idea, whereas saving everywhere isn't really a consistent mechanic for a normal or hard mode of this game, and removes the utility of the save points that already exist in the game, and drastically changes the pacing of the game. And talking briefly about the narrative changes, Strange Journey Redux does its best to actually imply that the endings that you get, if you were to go ahead and try to do the original Strange Journey experience to the best of your ability, it implies those endings are actually the wrong endings and not good, not worth doing. A good example of this sort of thinking is to play Persona 5 Royal. Within Persona 5 Royal, if you don't do the new Kasumi content, is it really playing the game the way it's meant to be played? and meant to be experienced? Probably not. So playing the original endings in Strange Journey Redux is probably not the way that they intended you to play to begin with. AJ Shida even mentioning, as I stated, that he wanted old fans to experience the new content. There's also a heavy-handed shrugging people do where they suggest that if you don't like the changes in the game, you can ignore them and simply get the same experience. Now thinking about the list of changes that I just explained, we can tell very easily that that's not the case. I've seen this online being compared to as a Christmas tree. Strange Journey is a Christmas tree, and just because you get new decorations in it, the decorations being a metaphor for the changes that Redux made, doesn't make it different. It's still the same at its core. And I would agree to some degree. But I think a more apt comparison is Samhain and Halloween. At its core, Halloween is Samhain to some extent, but to some extent it's changed very much due to the goals of the original purpose of Samhain versus what it became with Halloween. The people who changed Samhain to Halloween changed a lot of things in order to get what they wanted. In this case, this particular example, it was the Catholic Church trying to indoctrinate local peoples into believing in their religion. So the changes weren't really made by the people who invented the celebration. And in this case, it's very much the same. Strange Journey Redux is not really made by the people who are integral to making Strange Journey, with exception to Ishida. This may seem a bit hyperbolic or even over-exaggerated, but given everything I've talked about in this video, I hope you can see my perspective regarding that specific concept. At the end of the day, enjoy what you want and I don't really care, except enough to make a however long video this is talking about the games. There's a lot of things I wanted to say about Strange Journey, and this video has provided me an outlet to talk about most of it. I often find myself considering how to word things in an objective way or how to explain the story or how to explain the story of the development of the game in a way that's compelling and detailed. Now that I'm done, I just hope you enjoy the ride. This isn't my last conversation for about Strange Journey, but it probably is the most important one. Now I'd like to thank my only channel member, FF12Kid, he's been a longtime supporter and friend 
Becoming a channel member really kind of just helps me fund the things that I do, including researching these topics, importing the books that I need to read in order to make the detailed videos. I'd also like to thank Kid Capes for doing the whole section that I wanted to do, but I'm not nearly as competent in researching real world religion as much as Kid Capes is, so I think that he was probably the best person to tap the shoulder of to do that section. Make sure to subscribe to his channel and follow him on Twitter. If you'd like to support me in other ways, buy my merch, links in the description, comment on this video, subscribe to this channel. Follow me on Twitter, follow me on Twitch, or join the Atlas Discord server. Thanks again for watching and goodbye, fellow Megatennists.